my video now gone? Yes. Your video is gone, and it looks like we are live. We are live, and I will work on my video in the meantime. There we go. Hi, welcome. So, hello. Um, this is Bill Maurer and Don Patterson, and um, Katie Lustig is here on the side as well, um, and we are here for our Barter to Bitcoin class, where we will be doing an interview right now with Kevin McCoy, who is the founder of Monograph, and we're going to ask Kevin to introduce himself, um, say a little bit about um, what he's worked on, and if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to jump in via chat, and Katie will make sure that we get um, those comments so that we can answer some of your questions here live, hopefully. Don, did you want to add anything about the logistics, or should we just dive right in? Well, um, for if anyone's watching from our class, what we'd like you to do is take advantage of the chat channel on the YouTube panel. So once you sign in on YouTube, there's a chat channel on the bottom right, and if you want to ask any questions to Kevin or Bill or Katie or I, you can um, put them there. And that's a chat channel that's just among the class. So also feel free to talk about the content if you want. And um, just for a roll call, throw your name in there too so we can give you credit for attendance. If for some reason we drop out, that's going to be the end of the interview. Unfortunately, I can't figure out how to start it again, so hopefully that won't happen. Um, but welcome. Yeah, this is kind of a first for us, so we'll see how it works out. Great. So, um, Kevin, um, I'd like to just invite you to jump in now and introduce yourself and say a little bit about Monograph. Sure, sure. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Kevin McCoy. I am an artist uh, based in New York, uh, where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, I'm also a professor of, uh, in the art department at NYU, where I head up the digital practices uh, component of the art department. Um, and for the last year uh, now, I have been the, the CEO and uh, co-founder of Monograph, which is a web platform using Bitcoin technology to facilitate uh, ownership and uh, usage of digital, digital media, digital artworks and digital media. Um, so I'll say a few things about where the idea came from uh, that is you know, appropriate, I think, to what you guys are talking about in the class. Um, a couple years ago, uh, in 2011 into 2012, uh, is when I uh, first started looking at Bitcoin pretty closely. Uh, and uh, together with some grad students in my department, um, sketched out a number of ideas and just uh, did some research in the, um, in the area, looking at blockchain, looking at blockchain technology. Um, and at that time, and in first discovering it, it was really a, a utopian moment in, in the field where uh, it was really a kind of more about what Bitcoin couldn't do than what it could do. Uh, and it made for a really exciting and interesting time period. Um, in the fall um, of 2013, I started thinking concretely and specifically about how blockchain could be used to solve specific problems around authentication and ownership, uh, specifically of digital artworks, um, which was a problem that I you know, knew firsthand and experienced firsthand, uh, just issues of what is the, what is the file, and what, where is it, what does it mean, what do you mean to own it? Um, my own art practice uh, often involves software-based and code-based, um, digitally-based artworks, uh, and I have work in a number of museums uh, in New York and in Europe and in the U.S., and over the years I've been involved in many discussions with um, collectors and institutions around these kinds of issues. So I felt them directly, uh, and I saw in blockchain tech uh, a way to uh, try to solve those problems. Um, then, uh, the, to, to round out this pre-history, uh, about a year ago in um, May of last year, I was invited uh, to the new museum uh, here in New York uh, to a conference that they were doing uh, where I was asked to present uh, the work I had been doing on, uh, in this area, uh, and that was the, um, the kind of proof of concept uh, birth of, of Monograph. At that time, uh, working together with Anil Dash, who's a big social media um, entrepreneur, social media guy, we presented a proof of concept working version of, um, of, of the Monograph system where we, we were able to take uh, animated GIFs that I had made and create a mechanism, essentially a metadata record um, on the, um, you're using Namecoin, on the Namecoin blockchain uh, as a way of registering my authorship of the work and handing it over to, to Anil when he uh, bought it from me for 
five bucks on stage. Um, and that was the uh, that was the start of it. It got a lot of uh, attention, a lot of press. It was written up in a, a number of different magazines. Uh, we went to TechCrunch, uh, which is a big, you know, um, industry startup industry tech industry conference. Presented it there, uh, and then at that time, uh, the question was, okay, how does this? How could this function as a platform uh, for for anybody? Um, at that point, the new museum was starting uh, an incubator, which is an interesting conversation um, in and of itself, separate from blockchain. Uh, and they invited me to come and be part of this inaugural group uh, in their new incubator space uh, to answer those questions and figure out how um, how Monograph could could go forward. Um, since then, we've um, had some successful fundraising. Uh, we've uh, I brought in a uh, another uh, co-founder. Uh, who's a computer science guy uh, with an enterprise software background. His name's Chris C. And together we've sketched out um, uh, a much more robust platform that we are close to presenting uh, to uh, beta testers um, later this month and later this summer. So that's that's the backstory. That's Monograph. And you know, just in terms of fleshing out the problem that you're trying to solve a little bit more for the students, um, essentially what you've done is to create um, a registry to record ownership of digital digital goods, right? Digital works of art in this case, things that only exist um, in a digital format. And you mentioned animated gifts, but what are some of the other um, kinds of things that that this is good to to register ownership for? And why is registering ownership such a particular problem for digital artwork? Yeah, so the, the, there's a couple of things to keep in mind um, when we're uh, talking about this, um, and that is that that ownership of digital or, or non-tangible uh, items is not a new concept at all, right? And so, you know, we typically this has been handled through copyright, uh, which is you know part of the you know part, part of the foundational laws of, of the United States. Um, and then on top of cop, so, so there's a there's a copyright component um, that, that, that exists as a legal concept. Uh, and then on top of that, there's licensing and there's usage, um, uh, you know, permissions to use um, uh, media that's existed for you know also for a long long time. Uh, so in a certain sense, we're not doing anything novel, right? We're taking existing concepts, legal concepts. Uh, existing organizational concepts and trying to update them, streamline them, bring them to uh, a different sort of um, different sort of place. And, and blockchain technology plays an important role in that. Um, and so, to get back to the to, to your question, Bill, the in, in this case uh, about ownership, uh, I come from the art world, and so the, the, the fine art world, and so their ownership is a really important issue because. There's the idea of attribution on the creation side, the creator side, who made this, uh, and, and, and the art world takes that question very seriously. Uh, and then conversely, who owns this uh, is also something that the art world is very much interested in because typically the work of artists is considered to have some value. So those three properties, those three almost like anthropologically, uh, these three um, um, conditions of the art world are what are as important to us. Identification of the author, identification of the owner, and presumption of value of the media itself, kind of call it intrinsic value. Um, and that goes in the face of social media practice by and large, where certainly from a social media platform level, the media itself is not does not does not have any value, right? You're 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 sharing it, right, or kind of giving it away. Uh, of course, it turns out that it does have value, but that value is being captured by the social media platforms um, uh, through, through advertising. Um, and so then, on the other hand, outside of social media, we have very cumbersome mechanisms for um, rights, for, for legitimate rights usage. How do you know if you wanted to use a piece of media, you wanted to pay the, um, the creator and use it in a kind of legitimate way, very unclear how you would go about doing that. So the, the um, so monograph is really about trying to bring clarity to that situation, ease of use to that situation, and facilitate uh, a mechanism by which anybody can um, describe the media that they created, uh, assign value to it, assign rights to it, and the mechanism for transferring those rights to other people 
uh, with, with clarity about what has been transferred and where it ultimately went. Um, That's something that I've experienced in trying to put together materials for a class where I would like to use some kind of an image and it's not kind of a fair use situation, it's, you know, I just want to use it in kind of an advertising sort of way. And I found these great images, but I can't find at all where they're from. They're, they're on a billion different sharing sites, they're um, in social media, but, I, you know, even if I could find the author, or well, I guess I can't find the author in this case. Is there, is there a mechanism in what you're describing to sort of work backwards if you don't, like, if you find it, it, can you track down through a watermark or something where the initial ownership lies in, in the blockchain? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, I mean, you know, we're, we're at an early stage and, and, and Monograph is not some sort of, um, you know, anti-piracy magic fairy dust. Right. Um, but it does set up a uh, set of practices that if used and, and engaged with and, and, and taken up, uh, can can clarify that situation a lot. So I mean, and, and, and so on one hand, we're really on the um, heels of uh, Creative Commons, uh, which was also around licensing, right? It's Creative Commons is a license that sits on that sits kind of on top of copyright um, to to um, assign usage use rights to, to things. But you know, famously, it, it, it's all about sharing and it's non non commercial. And so you have you have attribution uh, and non commercial use. So Monograph, it's like, well, what can we do in that commercial sense? Um, obviously, we have media marketplaces, um, you know, all the way from Getty to iTunes, Spotify, and to me, that just shows the, um, the power of what can happen when that licensing component has been solved, licensing and payment has been solved. The problem with that is those are those platforms are are, are great, but they're really tailored for the largest players, uh, and they're very kind of centralized and controlled. Uh, mechanisms. So, um, in a bottom-up, grassroots sense, what tools are available to allow people to express their commercial intentions uh, around their ar around their media? Um, you know, we, we we're 10, 15 years into uh, social media and, and open sharing, uh, and that's that's wonderful. But people also now see that there's a need for some other kind of possibilities, some other alternatives. So, with Monograph. Um, you know, in, in a best practices way, uh, uh, the, the creators are incentivized to have Monograph be their first stepping off point for uh, their media when it hits the internet. Um, and so you can think of it as a kind of uh, opt-in ecosystem uh, that as it's picking up, as it's taken up and picked up, becomes, uh, becomes stronger. Um, but the licensing component is really, uh, is really tricky. Uh, it turns out that it's quite complex. Um, but and this is where blockchain uh, technology, I think, is appropriate uh, and, and, and interesting. Um, so uh, maybe I could maybe I'll speak kind of generally about um, about blockchain uh, yeah. at this point. Yeah, that would be great because I was I was actually going to invite you to say a few words about you know why would you do this using the blockchain instead of creating yeah. some other kind of platform? What were what were the characteristics of the blockchain that drew you to it? and what yeah. are the virtues that it holds to solve this particular problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the important thing to remember about blockchain is it is really just a database. Uh, it's a database that has very specific rules about how information is put into the database, uh, and it has very specific rules about how data would leave the database or not leave the database, as, as the case may be. Uh, it also has um, uh, social components uh, of, of distribution or replication in the sense that by design it is openly replicable in the sense that I can download, you know, if I download the Bitcoin client, for example, download the blockchain, I have another copy of what everybody else has. Uh, so it is, in that sense, it's decentralized. Anybody can decide to take the data and, and, um, and, and use it and copy it and have it and possess it themselves. So that decentralization component is um, is unique uh, in, uh, in in the history of database design because typically databases are monolithic objects that live somewhere. Maybe it's sharded or fractured or you know kind of chopped up and divided in different ways. Uh, but they're still very uh, vertically oriented with uh, with, with uh, administrator that's in charge of everything. Um, and, uh, and, and the blockchain, as, as as invented by Bitcoin, has very different kinds of properties. Um, so you need, and, and so there's a there's a kind of information theory or computer science component 
to blockchain, uh, you know, where it does solve uh, an interesting information theory uh, problem that goes under the name of the Byzantine generals problem. Basically, how do you trust information in a, in a non-trustworthy environment? How do you achieve consensus uh, or agreement uh, when you can't trust the nature of the messages being passed around? Um, is an interesting philosophical computer science technical problem, and and um, what what uh, uh, Sakamoto showed in the original Bitcoin white paper was a possible solution to that um, through the Bitcoin protocol, and that's cool. That's great. That's a very you know significant uh, achievement. But beyond that, uh, separate from that is blockchain as a social agreement. Does it does it solve real problems? Does it does it provide solutions? Is it something that people should um, engage with and spend their time with and use? Is it you know is it real? What's the what's the kind of marketing component to it that is actually valuable to people? Uh, and so, in our in, in you know I think that anybody working with blockchain technology has to answer that uh, because decentralization in and of itself is not necessarily the most important component. But so for us. We felt that part of what we are talking about is a return of control or ownership uh, to the to the edges, right? That me as a creator can make something, put it into uh, the network, uh, so, uh, an end user, a consumer, somebody who wants this piece of media can take this and, and use it, and 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 it's a and it's a point to point uh, relationship. In that sense, it's important that that data be decentralized and not pr putting monograph out as we are the new Facebook, we are the new Google, only this time we'll do it right. Um, so for us, it was a kind of a third party, uh, independent third party that we could point to um, as, the, as the underlying um, location of the data. Uh, that was the first part, uh, that was you know, the first um, reason that we felt that the blockchain was important. The other part, the, the other reason that the blockchain is important uh, is because th as a database, it's inherently transactional uh, by design. So if you're ever moving data from one place to another, one location to another, one address to another, you're affecting a transaction. And that transaction has certain properties, the most important of which is that it's irreversible. So there's a, a kind of expression of intent and expression of will uh, that, that, that goes into a Bitcoin transaction that is, that is like ownership and that is like the act of, of me giving something to you, transferring something to you. And so in a contractual or rights uh, standpoint, we feel that that's an, an important property. So can I clarify something just for the folks that are watching? When, when yeah. you talk about the blockchain, you're not, and I think I know the answer to this, but you're not talking about the Bitcoin blockchain that's the reference. You're talking about creating a separate blockchain-based technology to manage the rights as opposed to having digital rights layered on top of the existing Bitcoin blockchain for, for some, some way? Our, our approach could work in uh, a number of ways. We certainly have it up and running on Bitcoin, uh, and it works there. We have a really interesting um, rights modeling uh, uh, approach, rights modeling technology, um, licensing technology. That That's in the current blockchain? Yeah. No, it doesn't live. Now, not all the data lives in the blockchain. There's other data. It's more of like a proof, uh, a proof of right or a proof of record right. um, situation. Right, because of the constraints, uh, the big, you know, the, there's a lot of constraints about what kinds of data can go inside the blockchain, um, and so we have pointers to other data that can be independently verified. Right. Um, and then uh, in, in the original original case uh, back a year ago at the Mu Museum, we were using the Namecoin blockchain, and that design of that blockchain is that it can contain, it has more room for additional metadata, uh, and we were taking a very parsimonious approach to that metadata and could fit the whole thing um, in that space directly. Um, so these are the kinds of trade-offs uh, that, you're, that you're dealing with when you're working with um, distributed, this kind of distributed database uh, of, of where the information lives, where, does it, you know, where is it. And given that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very inefficient form of data storage and a very inefficient form of data reconciliation by design, um, you know, because the consensus mechanism takes time, the data is replicated by anybody who wants to have it. So, in the sense of Bitcoin, there's you know 7,000 or so nodes that are that are there. So there's you know there's 7,000 copies of that data. Uh, and so, if you have you know as as that data scales up and scales up, you're you're, you're you know replicating this data all over the place, which is you know inherently 
um, duplicative, right? Yeah. It takes, it takes, it takes time. It's not efficient. Um, so there has to be some kind of social good or, or larger social value proposition uh, at work um, to, to make it worth people's while, to make it interesting and useful uh, for people to have all that extra data and to go through the trouble of dealing with decentralization. And so to the Bitcoin faithful, those things are, you know, obvious to them. To everybody else, it's not necessarily so obvious. Well, let's uh, just check in with people watching, see if there's any questions that we've got for you, and we can continue here online. Um, if they come up, Katie will bring them in for us. Yeah, so far the, the chat has been kind of quiet, but I actually did have a question. Um, so how do you, is there a way to verify that, you know, I am who I say I am and that I actually am not just submitting something to Monograph that says, I take like, for example, I'm not taking, couldn't take your art and say, oh, it's my own and then it's in Monograph and everyone thinks that I own it. Is there a way to verify that I actually own the art that I own? Yeah, so I mean, you know, identity is a kind of metaphysical problem. Um, and, you know, I don't think that uh, it's been solved at, that, at the level of any of those levels, um, from metaphysics on up to, uh, to politics. So there, there certainly is an identity component to, um, to, to monograph, just as there is with anything um, online. Uh, and, you know, we live in an age of identity, questions about identity. So in the case of monograph, again, it's not magic uh, technology that's going to, you know, solve that problem completely. But it's, um, you know, and we have, a, we, we, you know, we, we've come up with a strategy for increasing the likelihood that you are who you say that you are. And we also do that by raising the stakes of you as a fraudulent actor. Uh, because we're a transactional platform, you're registering information with us that, you know, is, is financial information or, you know, if, if we're facilitating payments on your behalf, for example, then you've hooked up a bank account to this um, and, and, you know, other kinds of things. Uh, and, and, and are engaging in transactions that are fraudulent, so it's not just copyright infringement, but it would be more like wire fraud. So there's the force of law that, 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 that backs it up. Uh, with the goal, you know, with our goal being that we can have, um, you know, our goal is to have contracts that are viable uh, to, to, to different counterparties um, around the usage of, of media. I have no doubt that, you know, it doesn't stop screen capture, it doesn't stop, you know, just not buying licenses, it doesn't stop it doesn't stop piracy. It's about creating and facilitating um, an ecosystem in which people are incentivized just to buy it because it's easy. Uh, and I think that we've seen that happen over and over again with um, online marketplaces from iTunes on. You know, there's been a, um, a lot of interest in um, alternative uses of blockchain technology besides the money or currency or payment space. And um, Monograph clearly is sort of part of this, although it also connects up to the, the financial transaction space as well. I wonder if you might just reflect a little bit on um, where you think these alternative uses of the blockchain might be going. Like think, think out the next year, the next five years, um, where do you think that's all headed? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, from a from a information design and computer science perspective, there's no shortage of of, of use cases that uh, the blockchain faithful trot out. Um, you know, for you know, verifiable accounting to voting, um, the list goes on. Finan you know, stocks, financial agreements, uh, on and on and on. Um, and I think that in practice, um, it's a lot harder than that. And you can design uh, a system that has, that you feel has the attributes of this other system that you're trying to replace, like say voting or say um, notary, right? You get something notarized. But the question is, is it, is it believable? Is it viable? Do people accept it as, as legitimate? So you can see, you can look at the emergence of other protocols earlier on in the internet, like say SMTP with email. Um, and there was a, a time, you know, so email, you know, is a, a message exchange protocol. You can pass messages back and forth to each other, and right, you know, and this kind of software that uses the language of the post office, uh, you know, as, and then see what happens. And this, this all happened 30 years ago. 
Uh, and slowly, 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 that protocol was accepted, and people stopped asking, why wouldn't I want to have a copy of the letter? Why is it going to just be electronic? Um, so I think that the use cases are of, of critical importance in coming up with a solution that is useful to people uh, and that provides them real value uh, and doesn't just provide a theoretical solution to a problem that they're not, they don't necessarily know that they had. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest in the Bitcoin world around contracts uh, and, and especially in the financial side uh, and trying to uh, streamline that process. Um, and, and, you know, within the financial industry, there is real issues around settlement times, uh, you know, and, and trying to make that settlement process more quicker and, and more efficient. Of course, you're balancing security uh, and, and fraud detection um, and, and refundability, all these other attributes that are, are built into the cost and the time delay of the, of the current system. It's not like they haven't thought about it, <laughs> but there's a lot of... Uh, you know, effort and intelligence that have gone into designing this current system. But many aspects of the financial system are, are old uh, and, 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 you know, kind of come from different time, time periods. Um, but uh, so, so any solution has to be carefully designed and be solving real problems. And I think for me it's interesting to see what Ripple has done um, uh, just as, a, as, a, as an entity um, in trying to work more closely with uh, financial institutions, uh, you know, at a deep level, and create partnerships and go step by step, uh, versus the Bitcoin approach, which is you know more anarchistic and um, wild and woolly, uh, and and people in that community just assuming that when it, it that, the, that that the revolution will just slowly happen and eventually everything will be on Bitcoin just kind of magically, uh, you know, because of the superiority of the cryptographic no protocol. And I just don't know that that's necessarily the case. Um, and so, you know, you could say that, you know, again, now it's like, you know, to look at, you know, think about Spotify, think about iTunes, BitTorrent still exists, people can still pirate stuff, but, you know, people want to do it the right way and, it's, and, they, and, and eventually it's been made easy, and so people can go to these marketplaces. So I think that the use case is important and the user experience is, is really important. Um, and that's going to be the ultimate decider about what is going to be part of blockchain, what's going to go to blockchain, and what's not going to go to blockchain. Thanks so much. I don't know, Katie or Don, if you have any final questions. Um, I, I don't think so. I think it's very, it's very interesting. We really appreciate you taking the time to explain it to us. It's really hard for me to get my, my head around the idea of owning digital work, and I think that the point that you made about copyright being the sort of foundation for it makes a lot of sense and just sort of pointing out that copyright already exists it is exactly the same situation but it seems to me like one of the things monograph is trying to do is make copyright more efficient more broadly able to reach more broadly and to make the agreements more clear and transparent and that helps me to really understand a little bit more about where monograph fits into the system and in that sense yeah the blockchain Technology really has a lot to offer, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you know, we are we fundamentally believe that it's not about the bits; it's about the rights, and that the rights and the and and, and you know the, the the kind of club that can be made around the rights holders, like I'm in here and you guys are out here, is ultimately more important than the bits themselves, which can be go in lots of different places and be you know sent here and there. And if you can create create a mechanism where it's clear that. I'm the owner. Okay, you saw it. That's cool, but you you don't got it because because I got it, and I'm the one that has the rights to it. Um, yeah, again, this isn't a new concept. This is how film and TV has worked for a long, long time, uh, and so it's it's about trying to bring that that uh, approach, those tools, uh, to um, a broad swath of creators that yeah. are ill served by the current state of affairs. Well, great, Kevin. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. We really appreciate it. We know the students do too. They'll, they'll be posting some comments on the YouTube video hopefully later on. And um, we will be in touch with any other questions that pop up. But um, for now, thanks so much for, for sharing Monograph with us. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you know, if you've got stuff that you think you want to, uh, you know, it might be useful or valuable to people, um, come to Monograph. Uh, we're not accepting, uh, uh, we're, we're in the process of, of taking in emails and we'll be uh, um, sending out invites to the beta uh, over this next month. So um, come to monograph.com and uh, sign up for that and um, we hope to get you going soon. Great.
All right. Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks so much. Yep. Cool.